Dr. Kritika, Dr. Kailash and uh, <coughs> Dr. Jitendra Jain, they are all my pain friends, pain relievers rather. And uh, yeah, so I can invite now Dr. Jitendra Jain. Topic given to me is uh, lumbar radiculopathy. Uh, this is the topic I have mainly just uh, given a twist basically just that I want to stress more on the concept rather than giving the technical details about the procedures that we do. Okay. Uh, is there any definition to lumbar radiculopathy? Actually not. I have just created this definition for this particular talk which says that pain going down the leg. Radiculopathy meaning pain starts from your back or neck and goes to the area which it supplies. That's what radiculopathy means. Now if it is mainly just the pain part then it is more of radiculitis. That means it is more of inflammation. It usually is not accompanied by numbness or heaviness. But if there is numbness and heaviness along with pain, it could be something like radiculopathy. So people might differ on that, but this is what essentially we as clinicians understand this. Um, coming to the common causes that we see who have back pain and leg pain, if you see, look at the list, the patient who comes to your OPD or comes to a family physician or an orthopedician would have lumbar strain or sprain which constitute about 70% of their patient load. So this is a benign one. Degenerative changes would constitute about 10%. Osteoporosis, compression fractures about 4%. Herniated disc 4%. Spinal stenosis 3 and stonolysis is 2%. Now out of this, most of the patients would have back pain. That is, patient might have strain or sprain, which would be these patients would be complaining mainly of back pain, not much of a leg pain. The leg pain patients might be having degenerative changes, herniated disc, osteoporosis, compression fracture, especially if it is going inside the spinal canal. If it is not, then most of the patients might just present just with simple back pain. Spinal stenosis might have radicular component and spondylolisthesis as well. Now, whenever a patient comes to us with back pain and leg pain, we have to rule out what are the possible causes of back pain and leg pain? Now, it is just not spine. There are other systems like erogenital system, abdominal, cancer, metastasis, pregnancy, inflammatory changes, inflammatory diseases that can cause bleeding disorders in the pelvic areas. Shingles, tuberculosis, which is very common in our country. Actually, uh, when I was trained in Canada, I didn't see a single patient who was having spine tuberculosis. When I came back to India, I started examining patients and I would not stress on MRIs with these patients. But slowly over a period of time, I realized that I have missed so many patients who had tuberculosis, which is very rampant over here. And we have to sort of, we, we should not be stopping ourselves from subjecting patient to a MRI or a CT scan to find this a perfectly treatable cause just with medications. So it is very important to diagnose these patients. Now, when a patient comes to me with back pain or leg pain, what is my immediate requirement? The most important thing, I have to look for something which is very scary, which is mainly neurodeficit. If at all this particular patient has any neurodeficit or any sort of red flags for which I am going to come to. Now, what are the red flags? Now, if the patient has any history of trauma, if there is any history of trauma, that could be important pressing on the spinal nerves causing weakness. If patient is a minor, less than 18 years of age or 12 years of age, there could be malignancy which might be missing. Older patients who have back pain and leg pain, we have to rule out multiple myeloma or any sort of malignancy which is spreading to spine. Patient who has a history of cancer, also we have to rule out any metastasis which is spreading to that particular area. Bladder bowel incontinence, that obviously goes in neurodeficit. Urgently we have to attend those patients either surgically or whatever is the treatment options available to us. Now, constitutional symptoms of the patient who comes with fever, who has weight loss and lymph node enlargement, obviously goes in favor of a tuberculosis patient. We have to investigate. We have to do culture with these patients and treat them with anti-tuberculous treatment and if required, surgical decompression if there is any neurodeficit. Uh, major mot motor weakness which I already mentioned. Okay. Now, I'll just... Uh, uh, give you sort of a, a concept of how you'd have to differentiate back pain with radiculopathy. 
Now, if you see, mm, I'll, I'll use this. Okay. Okay. Now, if you see, this is a normal spine. This is a patient who has certain changes, bulging and herniated disc. Now, these are the nerves which are coming out from the transferominal area. Now, if you see, patient who has back pain does not mean that patient has prolapse into vertebral disc or a slip disc. Now, it just could be a disc bulge or an age-related internal disc disruption changes, which is causing peripheral annulus, which is the only sensitive part in the disc, to be stimulated and causing back pain. Now, this particular back pain usually is restricted mainly to back. It doesn't go down the leg. The leg pain comes only when the disc gets herniated, presses on the nerve root, and then the patient gets pain down the leg. There might be a referred component because of discogenic pain. That is the disc bulge or what we call is an internal disc derangement, which would mainly be a referred component. It won't be a radicular component where patient might be having numbness or heaviness. Okay. So there might be a sequester which again might present like a radiculopathy. So that's where the main difference is that the patient who has back pain does not mean that patient has slip disc or sciatica. Okay. There are various terms that we coin sciatica, slip disc and essentially what that means is that patient is having disc which is pressing on the nerve root which needs to be addressed. Now how do you diagnose this? Clinically, it is very evident when patient comes to you, back pain, leg pain. You examine the patient, patient has strictly, uh, straight uh, leg raising positive. He might have localized back pain tenderness. Now, in back pain, the patient might have mainly centralized back, which is sensitive, while the patient who has slip disc pain might have a gluteal pain, which is more sensitive. So, as a clinician, you should be able to appreciate that and differentiate whether it's a centralized back pain or more of a lateral back pain. Lateral back pain could be a nerve root pain, which is caused by L4, L5 or S1 sensitivity. Then we have radiological. Radiological x-ray is usually not very informative unless patient is having a spondylolisthesis where you want to see the instability of spine. EMG nerve conduction studies is important in certain aspects where you want to differentiate like Kailash has mentioned in cases of carpal tunnel syndrome or patient who has diabetic neuropathy, you want to rule that out that the pain and the numbness which patient is having is because of spine or because of diabetic neuropathy. Now if you see the MRI here, this is what the herniated disc is. Now if you see the color, this is white. The center of the disc is white, that means the disc is hydrated. Now if you see this particular disc, the disc is not very well hydrated. That means the water content has gone down. That means that the disc has disrupted. The IDD that I mentioned to you about uh, in f f the slide before, that has happened and patient is eventually is having herniated disc. Okay. Now, what is the treatment pattern that we follow? Conservative, obviously, you give rest to the patient for a few weeks. You give painkillers. You give hot or cold fermentation, whatever the patient is comfortable with. If patient responds, fine. If after 2-3 weeks, patient says that, okay, I'm not fine, then we have options of interventional pain blocks that we do or a surgical option. Now, commonly these patients would come and ask you whether surgery is actually required or not. The important thing that we have to remember as clinicians is we have to tell the patient that if you have neurodeficit, we as interventional pain specialists don't come into picture. Straight away patient goes for surgery. But if it is mainly pain-related problem, then definitely a pain block would be advisable and that should be done first before the surgery. So first, rest, physiotherapy, medicine. Second is injection, diagnostic blocks, radiofrequency ablations, open surgeries. Now, few of the unfortunate patients who have undergone surgery and still have problems, we still have options for them. So we are still a step above surgery. Okay, now, uh, this one particular slide that I want to stress on is mainly to show you interlaminar and transferominal epidural injection. Just to differentiate and stress upon the fact that a transferominal epidural steroid is more superior to an interlaminar epidural steroid. The reason for that is 
that when you inject with transfer terminal, the problem is in the, this is the disc area that you see. This is the disc where it has come out. It is in the anterior epidural space. The normal medication as anesthetic that we inject is posterior epidural space. Okay, unless you inject a big volume, the drug might not spread inside. Second, if the patient has a tight disc where the, disc, uh, the drug is not going to go in the anterior epidural space, it will be ineffective. Then, if the patient has facet joint problem, doing an epidural will not be of any benefit. Those patients will come back to you. There is about 40% failure rate with uh, regular interlaminar procedures as compared to transferaminal, which is about 10%. This is a post-surgical patient who has undergone a lumbar transfer amyl. Again in this, especially if there is a lateral disc, the epidural might not be as beneficial. Here again, lateral gutter spread of transfer amyl injection would be helpful for the patient. Okay, now just this is the second last slide where I have uh, given various minimally invasive intradiscal procedures thermal and non-thermal. Now what that means is basically these procedures are you go in the disc space and you do various different modalities that are available to us to decrease the intradiscal pressure basically to decrease the disc content so as to prevent radiculopathy for which patient is come to you. Now there could be a thermal method where the radio frequency usually is used to heat the part of the nucleus pulposus part of which evaporates and then shrinks the nucleus and that's how it shrinks the disc and hopefully will disc decrease the pressure that is coming on the nerve root. While in the non-thermal method, you actually take out physically material of the disc in which there is nucleotome decompressor. But the problem with all these fancy gadgets is that there is poor evidence to support them. Okay, So this is what essentially the patients of lumbar radiculopathy and we could offer them certain treatment options. Thank you.